Knowledge is what brings us together today. Today on Interman Radio, we are talking about marriage and true love. Ooh, love. <laughs> the kind between Christ and his bride. Wedding bells are in the air. Dun, 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 dun. Welcome to Interman Radio, where we accomplish more than we thought we could through Christ's power working in us, regardless of what your pastor said last week. Hey guys, let's drop the excuses, let's pick up our Bibles and prepare to win. Boy has met girl, Mark. It's time to cross the line and make a commitment because we've worked with the person to the point to where they want to join Christ in a relationship. Yeah, we, in essence, our job is to make the introductions. You know, our function is to really introduce people to Christ so they get to know Christ. And if someone really does desire to have the relationship with Christ, then there does come a point where it's time to sign on the dotted line. This is like earthly marriage. In fact, the scriptures use that, and we'll talk about yes, that it does. later. This is like getting married. So, But in society today, we aren't big on making commitments, right? Well, not commitments that we can't get right back out of. I mean, we're, we're yeah. good at commitments as long as they're not real binding. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, you buy a car, you got 72 hours to take it back, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, so, uh, but marriage is... Is that the same for women, too? If they get married, do they have seventy two hours? Oh, I to thought you were going to go husband? the opposite way. I was no, say, to we're not going their there. Husband, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it should be. <laughs> it should be. You're <laughs> it right. Be. All right. Too late, gals. <clears throat> too late. All right. So, but marriage does pay the price for that today. And it our, does. Our view of of not wanting to be caught into things that are legally binding, and because of that, our view of being married to Christ. Being the bride of Christ also can it as well, can't it? it? It really does. People people enter that relationship of being a Christian with sometimes much less consideration than they enter the relationship of earthly marriage. They never get married to someone that they haven't really thought it over with, but sometimes they make an ill-considered... We're not trying to keep people from becoming Christians, but no. frankly, if you're going to consider becoming a Christian, it's a much bigger commitment than earthly marriage. Yeah, because a lot, of, a lot of times people like to keep their options open. Yeah, that's right. I'm marrying you, but if this doesn't work out, you know, that's why we've got the prenuptial agreements and all that, and his account and her account and everything else. But really, when we're talking about marrying Christ, we're talking about uh, joining and in doing. we got to count the cost. We really do. People, unfortunately, kind of view Christianity the same way. They're going to be a Christian, but only because it suits them at the moment. You know, it's convenient. It serves their purpose at the time. I want my sins forgiven. I want a clean conscience. Right. But what right. about the other side? What about the other side? There is some cost. In, just like in, in marriage, before you sign on the dotted line, before you say, I do and you did, there needs to be some consideration about, hey, we're going to be one on every level. Yeah, Even what does that financially. include? Yeah, financially. And, and it seems like maybe we're treading on some thin ice here, but there really is truth to that, that when you become one, you become one. Yeah, Dave Ramsey is fond of mentioning the fact that mar- or that most marriages that end in divorce do so because of financial problems. But how many people make the same mistake when it comes to Christianity, and I'm going to be married to Christ, but we're going to keep two different checkbooks, Yeah, that we're not going to be financially on board. Right, and how about living quarters? Right, so you know, when you're married, you're you're living together. That's right. So, but how does that apply to accounting the cost with Christianity? Well, lots of times people will will determine where they're going to live or what city they're going to go to based on a job or based on being close to this or more convenient to that. But the fact is, the biggest consideration should be where does God want me to be? But lots of times that's kind of a side issue. Well, I'm going to move here to do this, and God's just going to have to deal with that. Yeah. All right. So then another thing we consider when we're getting married is that their family becomes <laughs> our family, right? In fact, yep. I was talking to a, a, talking to a, 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 Careful. a young man uh, recently, <laughs> and, and that was a concern is, uh, you know, it's like, you know what? You can choose your friends, dude, but you can't choose your family. No, you really right? can't. So, except for when you're deciding to get married. Yep. And so when, when you're choosing to get married, you 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 get the whole enchilada. You're marrying the whole group. And that's so true in Christianity. It's not like we can have our independent relationships with God here, but we're not going to be involved with the rest of God's family 
this is a holistic event. I mean, yes. you're, everybody is there, and God's family becomes your family, the and whole family. The whole family. And th- because of that, when we're counting the cost and we're being joined to Christ at every level, we're joined to his family. Yep. And we have to realize that going into that, hey, am I willing to sacrifice and be a part of this family? Yeah. That, that includes a lot of changes for us on a personal and even a social level. You know, the friends that I had before I got married are not the friends that I had after I got married. What? <laughs> I know. Shocker. It is amazing, isn't it? Because the dudes hanging out having pizza yeah, what is, up? is not exactly conducive to the marriage relationship. But, you know, our social relationships, our friendships change because we've come to a different point in our own relationships, we tend to hang out with people who are married instead of people who aren't married. So our social, our social circle is going to change also as a result of becoming a Christian. What we do for fun changes. Yeah, social circles change, recreation changes. I mean, it used to be back when you were single, Mark, you'd probably just hop in the car without even thinking about planning or anything. Hey, let's go to, I don't know, where you want to go? Let's I go kept somewhere. my fishing pole in the back of the pickup truck. Ah. So, so it was conveniently located after work. I didn't have to stop it anywhere. I just went straight to the river. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did for recreation but before I was started. married. Getting car seats back there, though, and they kind of <laughs> yeah. get in the way, don't they? <laughs> Boy, it's they, not the same. No. <clears throat> Priorities change. For Making sure. Making decisions on not just on what pleases us, but what pleases our spouse. An earthly right. marriage, that's a huge deal. How many people get married nowadays and, and you know, the, the young man coming into the relationship is still kind of a boy. He's used to getting his toy, and yet now he's got someone he's supposed to be looking out after. It's a big deal. That's not the right attitude to enter into marriage with. We're talking about real-world commitments, adult situations. We're talking about making totally it's a paradigm shift it's it's a it's an enormous change yeah tw- guys uh 12 year olds aren't ready f- to count that cost they cannot they, count that cost they they are not mentally capable of determining what am i really signing up for when it comes to physical marriage and they're certainly not able to count the cost when it comes to being spiritually married to christ they're not ready to stand up and make those kinds of changes or even have the 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 mental or spiritual wherewithal to accomplish that just can't be done for them. Yeah, Jesus is a good example as well because even, remember, he he is making some of his own decisions at at 12 years old. Uh, Like, for instance, when he's in the temple uh, teaching. Yeah, he's got dreams. He's got things he wants to do. But he followed his parents in subjection even after they came and said, hey, what are you doing here? Right. So at 12 years old, not ready to make that kind of a commitment to join in that marriage relationship. Uh, but let's say that after we've gone through this big scary list of all this commitment and everything, a person still wants to join in that relationship. We, so first. what you're saying is we've done everything we can to scare them away. Yeah. From, yeah. Do you, do you from realize? A yes. <laughs> I, you know, I, we say that in jest, but that's not honestly such a, such a bad... Christianity is not for everyone. Okay. And I think when it comes to making disciples... So oftentimes, the person who's trying to share their faith is so desperate to get the person across the table to say yes, they basically dumb it down and, and try and soft sell it like, you know, we'll just get them in and then we'll show them what Christianity is really like later. Yeah. That's not fair. And if we were to boil down this entire Making Disciples series into maybe two or three points, that would be one of them. Yeah. That this process of making disciples really is a process of, of, Straight up, letting the person know, here's what's at stake, here's what's involved, whether it's repentance. uh, And and when we're talking about joining Christ, this is marriage, people. It is. And they better take it every bit as seriously as they would if they're going to get married. So how do we get married? Let's put some rings on, dude. Okay. Well, let's ring it in Romans chapter 6. Being united to Christ. Romans chapter 6 lays out a wonderful principle for us. In verse 3, he says, Don't you know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Notice the way into Christ is into his death, and it takes place in baptism. Therefore, in verse 4, he says, We have been buried with Christ through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him, In the likeness of his death, that's baptism, certainly we shall be also in the likeness 
of his resurrection. That's the point where we are united with Christ. Okay, time out. Time out. Okay, so for, for a lot of the people listening uh, to this podcast, they 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 may have hit some brakes right now. Okay. Can, I thought I heard the squealing of tires and the smell of, yeah. of okay. burnt rubber. And, and the reason why is because uh, baptism role in salvation is controversial to a lot of people, but it's minimized in a lot of people's minds. And so when some people hear this, they think, uh-oh. You're saying that baptism is necessary for a person to become a Christian. What about the thief on the cross? Well, here's what I'd tell him first. Okay. <clears throat> Give us 10 minutes. Okay. Because here's, here's what happens. Is so many times when I have this discussion with people, they have in their mind a view of what they think I'm trying to tell them. Okay. They think that, that my view of baptism is one, two, and three. And they kind of have in their mind a preconception of what they think I'm going to try and convince them of. Because of maybe what they've heard before? Sure. From other, you know, they okay. were told about this or that. Listen, give us 10 minutes, and if you still disagree, fine. But I'm telling you that what, what we're going to tell you about baptism is probably not what you've heard before. So if you give us 10 minutes with an open mind and you still object, fair enough. Okay. But <clears throat> what you're going to hear is not what you think you're going to hear. All right? All right. Clock's ticking. Let's go. Here we go. Let's talk about Hebrews chapter 9. The thief on the cross is an excellent question because, as everyone knows, the thief on the cross turns to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Jesus turns to him and in response says, Truly, I say to you, you will be with me today in paradise. Voila! Yeah. Right? The man did not get in any water. No, nor, nor did he, he have the opportunity no. to do so. No. Because they're both on the cross. And Jesus himself said, you're going to be with me in paradise. So is the thief saved? And the answer is absolutely, unequivocally, yes, he's saved. So can we draw the same conclusion then about baptism for us as for the thief? There's two problems with that. Number one is you're not in the same position as the thief. You have the information. Number two, the thief was never told to be baptized. Number two is Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 16. He says, where a covenant or like a will or testament is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. It's never enforced while the one who made it lives. You know, if uh, if you're responsible and you've written out your will, It sits in a box, maybe a safe deposit box, or maybe a special drawer at your house, and it has zero power right? until you die. Now, when you die, that piece of paper that previously had no power has every power to determine what happens to your assets on the time of your death. Okay. Well, what the Scripture is talking about is there's a difference between the Old Covenant and New Covenant. The new covenant does not take effect until the death of the one who made it. Jesus' death. Exactly. Jesus is the covenant maker. And so at his death, that's when the new covenant comes into effect. So the thief on the cross was under the old covenant. He was forgiven prior to Jesus' death. That's prior to the coming of the new covenant. Exactly. So because of that baptism wouldn't have even applied anyway. Not at all. Because there is no being buried with Christ and raised again anyway because Christ hadn't died and been buried and raised. Perfect. That's exactly right. Jesus forgave a lot of people. In Mark chapter 2, he forgives the paralytic. He says, my my son, your sins are forgiven. He didn't say go be baptized. No one can be united in the likeness of his death, which hasn't taken place yet. But in Acts chapter 2, we read the first gospel message... Peter describes to the Jews on the day of Pentecost who Jesus is, uses the Old Testament scriptures to confirm that. And in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And Peter said, and the rest of the apostles said, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the new covenant laid out after Jesus' death by the guys who are in a position of authority to do so. That is the, that's the explanation of the new covenant. That is the first time we hear the gospel being preached after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, yes? Yes, and okay. what to do about it specifically, because yeah. they say, uh-oh, uh, you know, I mean, put yourself in their shoes for a second. Peter just said, you guys crucified the Messiah we've all been waiting for for a couple thousand years now. Not good. <laughs> Not, Not good. good is right. 
yeah, I like to say that ranks pretty high on the naughty list. Yeah. You know, you crucified the Son of God. And so they they naturally want to know, what are we going to do about that? And Peter explains, you need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what about this? Romans chapter 10, Ah, yes, uh, talks about how we become Christians, right? Doesn't yes, it? it does. Okay, but it doesn't say anything about baptism. Correct. What's up? Well, look. let's look at Romans chapter 10, verse, uh, verse 13. There's a quote, Joel. He says, For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay. To which we would say, Amen. Amen. That's Absolutely. right. Absolutely. That's precisely what it takes in order to be saved, is for someone to call on the name of the Lord. But what Romans 10 does not answer is how that process is supposed to take place. Well, doesn't it answer that, though, in uh, verses 8, 9, and 10? Of Romans chapter 10? Yeah. Well, he talks about confession. He says uh, in verse 9, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. With the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. With the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Yes. So perhaps the call is just is just the mm, how should we describe it? Is just the uh, the confession that Jesus is Lord. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see if that holds up to the rest of the scriptures. Okay. Turn over to Acts chapter twenty-two, and in Acts chapter twenty-two, in verse seven, Paul is describing his experience on the road to Damascus. And he says, I fell to the ground. I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? He said to me, I'm Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And to skip down to verse 10, I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise, go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. Most people misunderstand what took place on the road to Damascus. Paul became a Christian. That's exactly what they misunderstand. What? Okay. They, Paul did not become a Christian on the road. Now, Paul was convinced of the person of Jesus on the road. In fact, he even calls him Lord with that understanding in verse 10. Yes. He says, And I said, What shall I do, Lord, knowing to whom he is speaking? He calls Jesus Lord. Now, let's pause for a second. If the guys from Romans 10 who say that, that the confession that Jesus is Lord is sufficient, that's calling on the name of the Lord for salvation, then Paul would indeed be saved on the road to Damascus. Right. Everybody with me? Right. So his sins are already forgiven. Yeah, so if you're listening on the podcast, just nod so that I know you... Raise your hand, nod. Raise your hand. Okay. Raise your hand. That's silly. Yeah. (laughs) As if this podcast isn't. So when uh, when we get down to verse, uh, verse 14, right, so... Ananias is speaking to Saul. He's come into Damascus now. Ananias was sent by God to talk to Saul. He says, Saul, you will be a witness for him, that's for God, to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Whoa. Yeah, whoa is right. There's two things we need to address here. The first is, he says, wash away your sins. Now, if Saul had been converted and saved on the road to Damascus... His sins had already be washed. There'd be no sins to wash away. Right. So Saul has not yet become a Christian. He's not been regenerated. He's not been saved from his sins until verse 16. Even though he already confessed that Jesus was Lord because he calls him Lord. He does. And which is our second point. Ananias says, Be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on his name. The calling on his name has not yet taken place because Ananias tells him to do that as a part of baptism. That's how the call is going to be made. So in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, where it says, calling on the name of the Lord, when anyone calls on the name of the Lord, uh, this is how the call is made. Exactly right. This is how somebody makes that appeal to God for salvation. Okay, so we'll get into that. We'll wrap that up in just a little bit. But what about this one, Mark? Okay. What about it's... A work. Baptism is a work because we're not saved by work. Ephesians chapter 2 lays that out very clearly that we're not saved by works, correct? Right you are, right you are. Let's do do a a quick Old Testament illustration and then let's uh, let's come back to the New Testament for some solid fact. Okay, Okay. all right. So if you guys remember in 2 Kings chapter 5, there's this guy uh, called Naaman who is a leper. 
And he's from the country of Assyria, but he goes down to Israel through an interesting chain of events to see the prophet Elisha to be cured of his leprosy, or so he hopes. He goes to Elisha, and Elisha sends his servant, and he says, Naaman, wash yourself in the Jordan, dip yourself in the river seven times, you'll be clean. Yeah. Okay. That's what Naaman thought. Yeah. He said, the Jordan River is disgusting. He said, we've got much better water up near Damascus, where I'm from. A guy should wash in them and be clean. Right. So he's a little bit upset, and he's thinking maybe he'll do his own thing anyway. Well, cooler heads prevail. And Naaman decides, okay, I'm going to do it. And he goes down to the Jordan River, he gets in the water, and he dips himself seven times in the waters of the Jordan River. And on the seventh time, he comes up clean. Now, would we say that Naaman cleansed himself by his works? No. no. Why he, not? Didn't he do it? He did it. He, he did dip himself in the water. Yes, he did. Uh, he did. Aha! So baptism is a work. But he, <laughs> he, was, he, he was just following orders. That's right. Yep, he just did what he was supposed to do. And so Naaman didn't do anything to fix his leprosy. Naaman just was obedient and got in the water. Naaman didn't scrub it off. It was God that accomplished that when Naaman chose to have faith and be obedient to what the prophet told him. Which leads to a point that we'll, we'll examine a little bit further on about what actually makes it work in baptism as well. But that illustrates the point. So if Naaman had not, if he decided to say, I don't want to get, I don't want to get in that stinky water. Yeah, I'll there's go to no Damascus. Way. I believe in God. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll call on him. I'll pray. But I am not getting in that water. Right. What would have been the result? Nothing. He would have still had leprosy. He'd still be, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Absolutely. There's no, there's no question about that. Naaman, I mean, he, he dips himself six times. Why seven? Because that's what he was told. Right. And it wasn't, it wasn't that Naaman accomplished something. It was God accomplished something great when Naaman did as he was told, when Naaman had faith. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Here's the New Testament statement of fact here. In Colossians 2 and verse 12, he says, Having been buried with Christ in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. We would say it's crazy for somebody to think that Naaman cleansed himself yeah. of leprosy. Look at all that work you did, Naaman, to get yourself all clean. Yeah, exactly. And when Naaman gets done, he doesn't come out and say, Hey, guys, look what I did to myself. We know that because he actually goes to the prophet to honor him and tell him thank you. Right on, exactly. See, it's faith in the working of God, to quote the Colossians 2.12 passage, who raised him from the dead. Which is more reasonable, to say that somebody cleansed himself of leprosy or cleansed himself from sin? Well, you know, I think cleansing himself of leprosy would be, if, the, if one is easier, it would be leprosy rather than sin. Yeah. So if somebody gets in the waters of baptism, they'd be a fool to say, I have done this or this is my work, I did this, this is mine. That's ridiculous. All they did was ask. And that's what 1 Peter chapter 3 uses. Ask for what? To describe baptism. 1 Peter in chapter 3, verse 21, says, Corresponding to the flood, baptism now saves you. It's the water, baby! <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> 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 <clears throat> Baptism now saves you. Now he says, it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh. Now that's the external washing that you are responsible for. But an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Guys, if you thought that I was going to tell you that baptism is some work that you do that by which you're going to save yourself, that's totally wrong. No. And if, if, if that's the idea that you've been pitched before about baptism, then I would totally disagree with, with that idea also. Baptism does not save yourself. Baptism is the process through which we ask God to save us. In that way, it's not any different than the sinner's prayer. Frankly, the sinner's prayer, here's a news flash, does not appear in the scriptures. Nobody ever told someone who was becoming a Christian, hey, you need to say the sinner's prayer. All right. But we understand that a sinner's, that, that concept of saying, Lord, I'm a sinner, please save me, we understand that that's not somebody working, that's just somebody asking. Right. All we're saying is that God wants us to ask, 
But he wants us to ask this way. Immersion for the forgiveness of sins is the sinner's prayer. It's asking. That's yes. right. It's the appeal, as he puts it here in 1 Peter 3.21. It's the appeal to God for a good conscience. God wants to be asked. He just wants you to ask him the way he told you to. I, we should pause and just let that ruminate. But I know we're under the gun because we promised whoa, whoa, 10 whoa, minutes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> that's a big point. But there's another one that it goes with it that's really important. And that is, it's not the water. This, it's not. It's not getting wet. It's the faith. It's the it's the faith that God's going to accomplish what we ask Him to accomplish that makes it work. God, would you please give me a clean conscience? It's faith that He's going to do it that makes it go. Yes. Okay. So what if Naaman says, "I believe God's going to do it, so therefore I don't need to go see the water." Well, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Well, I thought you said it wasn't the water. It's faith that God's going right. to accomplish yeah. it through our asking in the water. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. See, the test of our faith is whether or not we act. If Naaman really believed, he's going to the water. But it's his belief that makes it work. If it wasn't, every time somebody went for a swim, if it was just the water that did the trick, every time somebody jumped in the lake, they'd be a Christian. Right. So some people listening to this have been baptized uh, as an outward sign of an inward grace. But they've been baptized. <clears throat> Why? They got baptized. Yeah, they did, but for the wrong reason. So the problem is faith wasn't there. See, the people, that's a really popular line. Well, they have faith in Christ. Yes, they do, but not what takes place in the waters of baptism. Romans 6.17 says, You have been obedient to the... Ah! You've been obedient to the form of teaching to which you were committed. So there has to be an obedience. There has to be a faith that motivates us something that is true about what we're doing that causes that to work. It's faith in the working of God. When somebody says, I was baptized as an outward sign of an inward grace, they're saying God already saved me, and baptism just follows. My sins have already been washed away. It's, it's just already a, form, a, done deal. a formality. Right. I'm just being identified with Christ. And that does not agree with Acts 2, Acts 22, 1 Peter chapter 3. Right on. Any of that. Okay. Right on. It's like, it's like Naaman said, I'm going to do it my own way. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be cleansed, and then I'm going to go to the water afterwards. Okay. It's not going to work. All right. Uh, some people listening maybe have been baptized because they wanted to dedicate themselves to God. Mm, I'll give I mean, that's half, good. Half I mean, that's really eh. good, right? Half I mean, an eh. Okay. Because, because that is the point where we really do dedicate ourselves to God, where we, in essence, sign on the line of marriage. But if we're talking about a resolve to do things God's way, yeah. that's really better described as repentance. And you guys who heard the Interman broadcast on repentance. Brilliant. It was brilliant. <laughs> yeah. 30 minutes of brilliance. <laughs> that'll make more sense to you. But the point where we resolve to do things God's way that's repentance. That's not baptism. Okay, some people listening uh, were baptized because they were required to do so to join the church. Eh, eh, eh. What? Sorry, that's not the way it works. Baptism, they're baptized. Baptism is for the specific purpose of forgiveness of sins and to receive the Holy Spirit. Anything outside that for any other reason is not a biblical reason. And so the faith was not present when the action was was done. So, defining terms. When you say the faith wasn't present, what you mean is faith being defined as when I'm when I'm becoming baptized, faith is this. God, I'm being baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. Would you please take my sins away and give me your spirit? That's exactly what we're talking about. He says it's an appeal to God for a good conscience. But it's not an appeal for a good conscience if you don't know that. Right. So, if somebody's baptized without the understanding, without the faith that I'm appealing for a good conscience, it's a totally ineffective. It, we might as well be we might as well be uh, baptizing three three month olds at sure. that point, you know, because it because there's no faith needed. We're, they got wet. They got baptized. They got wet. Okay. Uh, the, okay. So Jesus did it. Therefore, I do it. Same thing. Same thing. Uh, my friends were doing it at youth camp, and so I was pressured, and I wanted to because it was emotional, and I wanted to do it too. Same thing. Well, if there was campfire, I, no, that oh, does still doesn't well, count. Okay. That, that doesn't All count. Right. My parents pressured me. My parents <laughs> nagged me into doing it. How about that one? Yeah. Um, no. Okay. Uh, kudos for listening to your parents, but um, it doesn't count when making your decision to be baptized into Christ. It's not, it's not your parents' faith. It's your faith that matters. Okay, so Pastor Bob told me I needed to be baptized. 
Tell I, Pastor Bob to jump in the lake. Well, tell him he needs to be baptized. <laughs> yeah, <you're> what? Right. <laughs> so what, what do you mean? Wait, what's wrong with what's wrong with? So, so I'm sitting down with somebody and I tell them, "Hey, I've become a Christian." Yeah. And he says, "You know what, Mark? Uh, at this point, you really need to be baptized. It's yeah. really important." Mm-hmm. Because a lot of churches will actually do that. They, yep. they will say, oh, you know what, the next step in your Christianity is is to become baptized. Yep. And they'll blur those lines. Yes. What's wrong with that? I mean, because they're telling them to be baptized. That's good, right? Well, yeah, that is good. But the problem is faith is not a, is not a part of the picture. What they're going to do is they're going to say, well, faith is, is there because they believe in Jesus. But what we're talking about is faith in the working of God. That is what's going to be accomplished when I'm immersed. Okay. And that's what has to be evident. That's what has to be there if somebody is, is, if baptism has any power at all, it's through our faith. It's faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead and what we believe is going to take place on our account when we do it. It's the faith that makes it go. And you keep quoting the faith in the working of God. I just want to reference back to that for our listeners. That's Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Right. That's a great verse to, to look up and, and chew on a little bit because that really is, that's what makes this whole thing go. That's what makes it go. There's two things that are required for a clean conscience, the forgiveness of sins and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and the appeal for both of those is made in baptism. If if baptism is anything else but an appeal for a good conscience, for those two elements, it's not baptism. It's something else. But it's not biblical baptism. Okay, Mark, so a person knows what they're doing. They want to join a relationship with Christ. They want to be married. They know why they're doing it. Good, they know good. how they're doing it. Good. <laughs> now what? This well, is so exciting. Now what? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5 puts it this way. He says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. So the giving up of Christ himself accomplishes the sanctification of his bride. And then he describes that, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. Having our sins forgiven makes us an appropriate bride for Christ. That's amazing to me. But that's when the deal is signed, is when he cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That's really a, a great passage because that marries the whole idea of washing with Christ's uh, union with the church. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what describes the, the baptism as the place where, where that contract is really sealed. And then almost as a wedding gift, as it were, God grants to the individual the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit as a down payment see, of later redemption, the redemption of the body in, in the resurrection. But what a tremendous picture that is of Christ loving the church, giving himself up for her, and then her responding to that love by making the appeal to be cleansed and made an appropriate bride for Christ. It's beautiful. That's that's how, yeah, that's what it looks like. So for those listening to this, and maybe you've just jumped in on on this podcast, and it seems like, boy, they sure are talking about baptism. It's like everything revolves around baptism. No, it really doesn't. Uh, But this is where we're at in our conversation at this point when we're talking about we've made the decision we want to be a Christian. Now what's the next step? But our conclusion is that becoming the bride of Christ means being united with him. Uh, having faith in the working of God that he will, when we make an appeal to him for a clean conscience, the way the scriptures say to make that appeal, which is through being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, that he will do that work. He will complete that work. And in doing so, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This really isn't so much about baptism, Mark, as it is about our faith. That yeah, faith is the is the element that binds all of those things together. So someone listening might say, "Okay, but when I became a Christian, I was baptized for some other reason." Or how about this? When I quote became a Christian, someone might be saying that, "Sure, I wasn't baptized." Someone might say, "You know what? When I was baptized, I I was baptized without ever really counting the cost. I was I was a really young person. I was I, I junior high, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So 
So what would we say to those guys? You know, people people tell me that all the time. I'll ask them, i say, well, how did you become a Christian? they say, well, you know, when I was 8 or 10 or whatever, I gave my life to Christ. And then uh, later on, you know, I, maybe I fell away or maybe I didn't or whatever. And later on, I was baptized and so on and so forth. And so, guys, if that's where you're at, listen, I'm trying to be as clear as possible to you. You have not become a Christian. Now, it doesn't mean you've done something wrong or that you should be or that you should be punished you're very much in the same condition of some guys in acts chapter 19 who just hadn't heard all the information before now mark that's not to say that someone who hasn't become a christian but they've made changes in their life they've expressed faith in christ to people maybe they've made some major changes in life maybe they think they've been a christian for years that's not to say that all of that is for not as far as life changes go oh no not at all in fact you know the last what, three episodes of Interman Radio have been all about those very changes, about confessing Christ as Lord and doing that publicly, being identified publicly through that process as a disciple of Christ, moving in that direction. Repentance is a change. I mean, all of those things we've talked about, we're not setting any of those aside. It's just that now it's time to become a Christian. Now it's time to sign on the dotted line, uh, you know, the on that marriage license, if you will, and become united with Christ. So for a lot of people listening to this, I mean, this is new information probably for a, a large segment. Yeah, a large segment. And for those where this is new information to now you've got some things to chew on. You've got some new information just like they did in Acts chapter 19. You have some new info to chew on. But there's also, um, there might be some folks listening who maybe this isn't new or maybe it, maybe they, they get it, but, but ah, pride, pride. We would like to say that would never happen. You know, no, 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 not pride. But it does sometimes. People look back and they say, "Well, I can't." I mean, I've. Are you telling I've, me that I'm that yeah. all that Sunday school teaching that I did is yeah. I was not a Christian? And I think we need to be upfront about that. And hey, listen, if it's a if it's a pride issue, swallow it. Uh, what difference does it make, honestly, if you have or haven't been a Christian up to this point? Would we let that hold us back from becoming a Christian because we found out that we weren't a Christian? I mean, that, that seems totally counterintuitive to me. Yeah. So really the issue to deal with is what do I do now? Today right. if you hear his voice. I mean, what, what do we do Great. today? Exactly, exactly. So you've got the information, something to chew on, something to think about, and something to act on. So like the guys in Acts 19, they have a choice to make. They're either going to say, you know what, I'm not going to listen to that. Already, already did the baptism thing, and uh, we'll let the Lord sort it out. Or, hey, maybe we act on it. Paul says, hey, you guys need to be immersed. And so they were. Praise the Lord for that. He didn't tell them that, you know, all of your previous sacrifices up to this point are totally wasted. Right. He just said, hey, guys, you got some new information. Let, let's get on it. Uh, it's similar to what happens in the case of Naaman, right? Yeah. So if if you find yourself in that spot, by all means, we'd love to chat with you, whether it's Facebook, behind the scenes, messaging or whatever. We're here to help you work through that if that's what you'd like to do. For sure. And uh, we'd be praying for you. And we'll catch you next time on, on Interman, Interman Radio. Radio.